And at last, um, the wonderful world of cladistics and clades, which is easier than you might think um, from looking at the stuff that's in, in the book. So the old way, older way of classifying things, um, where we use this system of uh, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus and species, and we could fit all living things into um, using these categories. So we had the five kingdoms, you know, the animals, plants, uh, protists, prokaryotes, and um, the fungi. And then you could work down through the different phyla and, and so on. Um, that system is fine, it works okay, it's useful um, in a lot of cases, um, but it, it turned out that it wasn't as good as uh, showing certain things, it wasn't really representative of everything that was going on. So for example this system basically relied on looking at the, the morphological differences and the anatomy of uh, morphological, the, the shape, morph means shape. Um, so studying the shape of organism, you know, did it have six legs or eight legs or in, in very simple terms um, And obviously it got a bit more complicated than that. So, you know, looking at things like mammals, for example um, The reason that organisms put in the mammal group is actually nothing to do with um, Having hair or giving birth alive young or whatever it may be because there are actually quite a few um, Organisms that, that also do those things that aren't classed as mammals um, the, the thing that you use to, to group mammals is to do with a, a bone in their jaw, bizarrely enough, which all mammals share in common this particular shape of jawbone. Anyway, having said all that, I suppose it comes down to this, this problem word here, species. And I guess by now we're familiar with the, the idea of a biological definition of species is when we have two organisms that can to gametes, if you like, male and female gametes, that together can produce a fertile offspring. And we'd say those two things are of the same species. Okay, well that's all right, but what happens if we've got organisms that don't breed by having female and male? So it's not gonna work for bacteria, for example. What about organisms that can um, asexually reproduce and binary fish and all that kind of stuff? This kind of idea, it was useful for lots of things, but not so useful when you got down to um, you know, it's useful for big organisms and giraffes and daffodils and um, lions and stuff, the things you're familiar with, but actually a lot of organisms that you wouldn't come across normally, it doesn't really work. So the idea of cladistics uses how closely related organisms are. It, it comes from a, a Greek word that means branch. So it's when you get these diagrams with kind of branches going off like this, or you sometimes get the, the ones that a bit simpler I think possibly to look a bit more like that and what it does is it shows the um, relationship between organisms how close they're related are and common ancestors so this organism here whatever it was is the common ancestor of anything on that branch that branch that branch and that branch okay and we would call this whole thing a clade so all of these organisms belong to um, the same clade sometimes it's called a monophyletic clade it includes the original ancestor whether the ancestor is alive or not today and it includes its descendants whether or not they are alive today so um you know the the clade that would include dodos for example the dodo would still be in there there's none left they're extinct but they'd still be in there um if we looked at an example of um so reptile clade um you get something that basically you've got one uh, original uh, original common ancestor and you get things coming off you get your turtles and tortoises that kind of stuff um, snakes and lizards um, but then on, on this kind of branch you've got all your dinosaurs and it's always nice to put um, dinosaurs in so you've got your dinosaur branch um, and then you've also got birds and finally things like crocodiles. Um, now this is not telling you anything about necessarily when these things arose. I mean crocodiles have been around for a long 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 time. Um, birds certainly arose later on but what it is showing you is the the relationship between uh, these things that they're all genetically related. You wouldn't necessarily have put um, birds as being more related to you know things like crocodiles than they are to, to snakes and lizards but there we go that's what um, 
it shows that they have that common ancestor. So that would be a clade, for example, there, because it contains um, the the dinosaurs, the birds, and the crocodiles. Of course, dinosaurs are, have gone now, they're extinct, but we still include them in that clade as we do the common ancestor. If we wanted to make our clade bigger, we'd have to include the common ancestor of that branch and that branch as well. Now it is possible to look at separate branches. Um, so this is, you know, if we looked at that and turtles, we could call them paraphyletic because when we're not including snakes and lizards, but that, I wouldn't worry too much about that unless you're really sort of looking at this, those, those kind of terms. I know they come up in the book, but that's what it's talking about. The monophyletic clade is, contains all of the um, ancestors and the common descendant paraphyletic looks at, at them going across um, and it is actually believe it or not more useful because it's showing the the relationship how do they get this relationship um, it's basically using um, DNA you know that that's what they're looking for and looking at things like protein structure they can look at now so the protein in crocodiles and they compare to the proteins in birds or the DNA in crocodile DNA in birds compared to say lizards and these things are closer uh, closer related than, than those things. Um, and the other area it becomes interesting, I suppose, is uh, in domains. And the idea in domains is that originally where we had these, um, or the, the, the five kingdoms, it turns out that um, these things are related in different ways when you actually look at the DNA. So for example, everything that used to be thrown into um, the prokaryotes, basically the bacteria, it now turns out that that isn't the, the true case when we look at it genetically. So we have um, what's sometimes called the U bacteria or true bacteria, or sometimes just bacteria to be honest, um, the archaea and um, eukaryotes okay now if you looked at a bacteria and an archaea oh i've just realized i've got an extra a in there <laughs> let's make it in green so i can correct my spellings um yeah apologies for that um if you look at the the genetics behind eubacteria and archaea archaea seems to share some things in common uh, genetically with eukaryotes um almost more than it does eubacteria. And so it decided that this is actually a, a separate group. Um, and once people started looking for archaea, they found them in um, more places than they thought. So a lot of extremophiles, for example, seem to be archaea um, rather than um, bacteria. And so now things are grouped into these three domains. So all the things that we're basically familiar with, animals, plants, um, and protists, uh, and fungi would come under this group of eukaryotes because they're more closely related to each other than they are to these things. But it's interesting to see, you know, that was that seems to be the split seems to be that bacteria split off from a common ancestor of these two. Um, and so you, you sometimes see this kind of clad, cladogram and it's done, it's got like the th sort of three branches coming off and it's it's often drawn as a circle. It looks really complicated like that. But all they're doing is they've, they've taken a flat one and, and bent it round. Um, but it's worth having a look, but that's the other place that you'll see um, clades come up.